the line is often said, if you fall off the horse, you've got to get right back on. Uh, my family had two horses on our acreage. Well, more, more accurately, we had a horse and we had a pony. Uh, the horse belonged to my sister. It was a retired barrel racing horse and by the rider's command could, in addition to all the normal walks, trots, canters, and gallops, um, by command it could walk backwards and sideways. It had all sorts of tricks. It was stunningly beautiful and amazing. The pony, on the other hand, uh, belonged to me. Uh, she was old, cranky, cantankerous, and beautiful in a mangy, long-haired draft pony kind of way. Perhaps, however, she was cranky because she was owned by a child that didn't know how to saddle her properly, uh, often forgot to mount on the left, and would often walk straight up behind the horse, threatening to spook it and get kicked in the teeth, um, and one who often forgot to clean out its stall. So if you fall off the horse, you've got to get right back on. I rarely even got that far. My relationship with this pony was complicated. And I was constantly confronted with her strength and her temperament in comparison with my weakness and inability. I remember every time going to ride thinking, this could go horrible. One time she bolted. I got on the horse and she just bolted. And it was a long time before she got tired, not when I told her to stop because she didn't listen. I remember thinking, do I really want to do this? Constantly confronted. Constantly tempted to just walk away and say, I'm glad I have a pony. I like the idea of this pony more than I like actually being with this pony. And I think she knew that. In a similar fashion, our passage today in Acts 17 contains regular confrontation, constantly being tempted to reject and turn back, constantly being faced with the question, what do you really believe about this? See, on the heels of persecution in Thessalonica, maybe we can call it falling off a horse. Paul and Silas, they leave in the night. They head to Berea to continue their missionary journey, continuing to bring the news about Jesus to each and every place that they go. And the Bereans that Paul meets, they're confronted with a message about the Messiah. And they have to wrestle with, is this true? Is it trustworthy? Will I believe it? Will I act on it? today. Paul then gets reconfronted by persecution and opposition and has to decide yet again, will I get back on this horse? Will I continue? And reading in Acts 17 isn't just a message about something that happened one time back then. It actually displays for us a pattern. God's word about Jesus confronts us. It's constantly questioning our assumptions it's calling out our sins. It's giving us new lenses on life and asking us to look this way as we see things. And it's questioning our commitments. It's confronting us. And we constantly have to answer, is it true? Is it trustworthy? Will I believe it? And in light of these confrontations, we're, we're tempted to reject it. We're tempted to reject the messengers God gives in our lives who speak to us. And we're tempted to resort to our own thoughts and retreat to our own comforts and senses of safety. Please turn with me in your Bibles to Acts chapter 17. We're going to read verses 10 to 15. And if you're new to the Bible or to the book of Acts, Acts is in the New Testament. It's the fifth book. It comes after larger books, Luke and John. Acts chapter 17, 10 to 15. The brothers immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea, and when they arrived, they went into the Jewish synagogue. Now these Jews were more noble than those in Thessalonica. They received the word with all eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. Many of them therefore believed, with not a few Greek women of high standing as well as men. But when the Jews from Thessalonica learned that the word of God was proclaimed by Paul at Berea also, they came there too, agitating and stirring up the crowds. Then the brothers immediately sent Paul off on his way to the sea. But Silas and Timothy remained there. Those who conducted Paul brought him as far as Athens. 
And after receiving a command for Silas and Timothy to come to him as soon as possible, they departed. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thanks for this um, historical event that happened. Father, we pray that you'd use it not just to teach us about what happened then, but to teach us about your true and trustworthy word today. Would you help us to see as the Bereans did the truth of your scriptures and put our faith in the Christ they speak of? And would you help us to be ones who walk in faithfulness in the midst of this? Pray, give us ears to hear in this time. In Jesus' name, amen. So Paul and Silas, they're persecuted in Thessalonica and they walk 45 miles away to the town of Berea. And it's possible that they only go to Berea on their journey because they're hoping to return. If you remember from a couple of weeks ago, they only were able to be in Thessalonica for three weeks. And it's possible that they're longing to go back there. But Paul goes about what he always goes about, and he goes to the synagogue and continues his mission. So the question we're asking is what happened? What happened when Paul and Silas went to Berea? And the first thing our text tells us today is that the Bereans examined the scriptures. Look with me in verses 11 and 12. Now, these Jews were more noble than those in Thessalonica. They received the word with all eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. Many of them therefore believed, with not a few Greek women of high standing, as well as men. First thing it says is it calls them more noble. And the word here is actually the word that would be used if they were actually noble-born, if they were of noble uh, nobility in that time. But the other way to understand it then figuratively is that they had nobility of mind. They were open-minded is how some translations put this. It's those who have the nobility to approach something new, Consider its truth, weigh its reasons and its arguments, its presuppositions, and how it fits with the world around them, and make a decision. They were noble-minded. The text goes on to say it describes this open-minded, noble-mindedness in two ways. They received the Word with eagerness, and they examined the Scriptures daily. Well, they received the Word with eagerness. Why? One thing I think this text shows is that the Bereans had been reading their Old Testament well. Essentially, they knew that God had promised some things, and they were longing, longing for the fulfillment of God's promises. They had expectations for a Messiah. They were waiting for one who would be a prophet like Moses, who spoke with God face to face. They were waiting for one who would be a king like David and reign in righteousness and set the world to rights. They were waiting for one who would accomplish God's promises to Abraham and the people of Israel. Paul likely walked in and said, greetings from Antioch. I'd like to talk with you about the Messiah. And they said, okay, let's make space. Let's hear. They received the word, yes, tell us more. We've always wanted to know more about this promised one. They received the word with eagerness and they examined the Scriptures daily. This word examined, it's a legal word. It's the word that was used in these times to talk about examining a witness, to fire questions and test. Does the story hold true? Is it worth thinking about? And that is exactly how it's being used in this context. Paul was setting forth Old Testament texts, Old Testament characters, Old Testament stories, Old Testament promises, and saying, this is my case. Jesus is the Christ. And they examined it. They fired questions at it daily. In Thessalonica, he spoke on three Saturdays, three Sabbaths. In Berea, he's getting called to speak every day. They received it with eagerness, and they're examining the Scriptures daily. And what he's sharing with them is likely the same thing he's been sharing everywhere. It's mentioned in Acts 17.3. He's reasoning and proving that the Christ must suffer and rise from the dead, and that Jesus of Nazareth is that Christ. They received the word eagerly, they examined it daily, and therefore, verse 12 says, many believed, and not a few Greek women of high standing and men. Notice this response, many 
Not a few. Jews, Greek women of high standing, men. How encouraging this must have been for Paul and Silas. This must have been exactly the response they were wanting. And um, Paul is confronting them, and I keep using the word confronting, and I'm, I'm, I'm understanding you might be hearing me saying confrontation, and that's not the idea I'm giving. He's putting forth truths and saying this is true and trustworthy, believe in this, and it's confronting the way they saw. So this is an encouraging response, and it's an expected response, and it's the way many respond still today. Confronted with the truth about the promised Messiah and the truth of Jesus as that Messiah, and they believed. So what happened when Paul and Silas went to Berea? The Bereans examined the scriptures, and many believed in Christ. I'd like to meddle for a minute. Meddling is uh, when you, when you kind of, I'm stepping away from what's absolutely true and making an argument for what's possible. I'd like to meddle and pretend I'm Paul, if I can do so. What did Paul share? What might he have said. We've seen many examples throughout Acts of Paul speaking, but I want to bring forth seven things Paul might have said from Isaiah 53, one chapter of the Old Testament. And what I'm inviting you to do is examine the scriptures daily. Read Isaiah 53 later today and ask the question, is this true? Isaiah 53 writes, the prophet Isaiah is writing of a servant, and that servant is the Messiah. Let's examine this case. The Messiah has to be from the line of David, according to Isaiah 53. Jesus is. The Messiah has to be visible to the nations, not just the people of Israel. Jesus was crucified by the Romans and persecuted by both Romans and Jews. The Messiah, according to Isaiah 53, has to be rejected and despised mistreated, viewed as one stricken and hated by God. Jesus certainly was. The Messiah, number four then, the Messiah must suffer not for his own sin, but on behalf of others. On the cross, Jesus paid our sins. His wounds were for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. His chastisement put on him brings us peace, and by the stripes of his wounds, we are healed. His shed blood brings healing. According to Isaiah 53, the Messiah must, Messiah must be affiliated with both the wicked and the rich in his death and in his grave. Think about this. The Messiah, according to Isaiah 53, 700 years before Jesus, has to be affiliated with both the wicked and the rich in his death. Jesus was crucified as a traitor between two criminals, wicked yet buried in the tomb of a rich man that no one had ever been buried in again, affiliated with both the wicked and the rich in his death. Sixthly, the Messiah must see after his death. The Messiah must have light return to his eyes, is the sense that Isaiah 53 is giving, after death. Well, Jesus was raised to life and sees even now. Lastly, the Messiah's suffering, death, and enlightening, seeing, must result in the forgiveness of many. It must result in the giving of righteousness to those forgiven and the dividing of spoils with those who find their share in him. See, Paul could have reasoned not just that Jesus jumped through the right hoops, born in Bethlehem, born of a virgin, born before the temple is destroyed, he could have also reasoned not just prophetic future events, but prophetic doctrine. The message of Isaiah 53 that Paul could, if we're still allowing me to pretend, that Paul could have stated is that Jesus' death atoned for the sins of many. Believe in him today. See, Paul shared and confronted them with the truth. The Messiah must suffer and rise from the dead. And Jesus is that Messiah. And they examined the scriptures, and therefore they believed. They heard from Paul and Silas, they wrestled, they examined, and they believed. How about you? How are you engaging with God's word? Do you receive it with eagerness? Do you examine what it says about Jesus and what that means for you? Do you believe? 
Maybe you're asking, how? Well, as Bill already mentioned, community groups continue. Women's and men's Bible study continues. Sunday school continues. Children's Sunday school continues. Keep listening. Keep examining. Pray and ask for ears to hear. Maybe you're not asking how. Maybe you're asking why. Why would I receive the word with all eagerness? Well, I commend to you that God's word is true. It's truthful and it's trustworthy. It's not the meandering thoughts of a few random men from a long time ago on the other side of the world. No, it's the true, historical, timeless, and timely Word of God. It lets you know who God is, who you are, and what God has done to relate with people, and He longs to draw you into that. Maybe you're asking, what does it mean to believe? What must I believe? Well, faith is the means by which we receive, accept, and rest upon Christ offered in the gospel. It's really that simple. And what I've shared today is true. Jesus suffered, died, and was raised for you. So if we ask the question, what happened when Paul and Silas went to Berea? The first thing we see is that the Bereans examined the scriptures and many believed in Christ. But that's not all. So what happened next? The next thing that happens is that the Thessalonians incited the crowds. Look with me in verse 13. But when the Jews from Thessalonica learned that the word of God was proclaimed by Paul at Berea also, they came there too, agitating and stirring up the crowds. See, this was an exciting time. If we, if we just reflect on the moment that's in history that's happening, this is an exciting time. The Gospel of Mark, the Gospel of Matthew, the Gospel of Luke, the book of Galatians, and possibly some of Paul's other letters are all circulating. People are walking from town to town, mile after mile, saying, behold God's word about Jesus. And the New Testament as we have it today is being held and walked into these places for the first time. People are walking miles on end to share stuff about Jesus to people on purpose. And in the midst of that, the spread of the gospel in Berea traveled back 45 miles to Thessalonica. And the Jews there who had already rejected Christ, they had already heard Paul, and they'd already sought to hurt him and the other disciples were confronted again. Is this true? The word of God goes to Berea in this way? Never. We can't allow this. Let's walk and let's put an end to this. And they walk, emboldened with a fresh sense of anger, to try and stop yet again the Word of God. And it says they agitate and stir up the crowds. And the idea behind them, the idea behind these words isn't that they kind of had a one off protest and said, We did our part. No, it's agitating, stirring, it's constant, continuous, fervent passionate. This must end. And they seek to put an end to Paul's movement. And we'll see in a moment that their inciting of the crowds necessitates a response from Paul and Silas and Timothy and others. We'll get to that in a second. So what happened when Paul and Silas went to Berea? Well, their ministry was so fruitful that the word went back to Thessalonica and confronted with the message of Jesus again they came to incite the crowd and put an end to the spread of the gospel. You know, I was wrestling with, how do, you, how do you bring to light this type of villainy? And I think it's kind of fair to call this villainy. Passionate, seeking to put an end to another. And I thought of a few examples. You know, it's like the, from, the, from the movie Amadeus, it's like the court composer who sees Mozart's genius and is undone by it. I'm not a genius like this, and seeks to put an end to Mozart. It's the emperor from Gladiator, who the very existence of Russell Crowe's character threatens his entire reign. He's built his life about that man being not the heir and me being the heir. It's, it's the, the villain from the Count of Monte Cristo, for whom the Count's existence threatens his entire life and family. It must end. And even, even, it's the story of PJ Masks that maybe some of your kids watch on TV. There's a character, Luna Girl, 
whose whole mission is to put a stop to these friends in their pajamas and their heroism. We know this story. It's the villain for whom the hero just can't be allowed to exist. And when confronted with God's word yet again, the Thessalonians doubted. They doubted its truthfulness, and they went to great lengths in order to try and stop it. When confronted, because I've already said God's word confronts us, when confronted by the true and trustworthy word of God, week in and week out, how do you respond? Does that which was once exciting now wane? Or does that which was once exciting continue to deepen and take root and transform your life? We're confronted by God's word and we're called to respond in faith. See, the Bereans examined the scriptures and many believed. The Thessalonians incited the crowd and sought to put an end to the preaching of the gospel and the examining of the scriptures. So when confronted again, what, what's Paul going to do? If he's been kicked from the proverbial horse yet again, how will he respond? Well, the text is clear. The brothers endured the calling. They endured in their calling. Look with me in verses 14 and 15. Then the brothers immediately sent Paul off on his way to the sea, but Silas and Timothy remained there. Those who conducted Paul brought him as far as Athens, and after receiving a command for Silas and Timothy to come to him as soon as possible, they departed. Excuse me. See, confronted again by persecution, the Christians, both new Christians in Berea and Paul, Silas, and Timothy, they have to decide how will they act. What will they do? Will they get back on the horse. And I love, I absolutely love the way the passage expresses this. In verse 10, it's the brothers. Here in verse 14, then the brothers. See, this isn't Paul saying, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to captain this thing. I'm the quarterback. You do what I say. No, they made this decision together. Paul's not dictating and Paul's not running in fear. No, this young fledgling church pulls together and says, how do we be wise right now? What do we do? See, when Jesus sent out the apostles two by two, he instructed them, be innocent as, serp as, <laughs> innocent as doves and wise as serpents. I almost flipped those. Be innocent as doves and wise as serpents. And that's how they are. They're faithful to the message, innocent, and they're acting wisely. See, they probably decided the Thessalonians actually just hate Paul. So let's send Paul to Athens. And Paul can start continuing the mission there. And let's leave Silas and Timothy fully trained, fully capable, wonderful ministers of the gospel. Let's leave them behind in Berea. And they can continue to establish this church. And you new believers, you have a role to play too. Help Paul get to Athens. And so these new believers are the ones that get Paul where he's going. Everybody had a part to play. And everybody endured in the face of opposition. They endured the calling. Not all were called to the same role. They didn't all get sent to Athens. They didn't all get sent to lead the church in Berea. But all were faithful in the face of direct opposition. So what happened when Paul and Silas went to Berea? The brothers endured the calling. And the word brothers there is just the generic word for brothers and sisters. It assumes at all points women as well. And actually, we've already seen who believed? Some Greek women of high standing. So women are involved in this process. They have a part to play. When Catherine and I lived in New Zealand, um, they're really passionate there about this thing called the America's Cup. It's a sailing race. And uh, it's, it often boils down to an American boat racing team and a New Zealand boat racing team. The New Zealand team is called Emirates Team New Zealand. And they're headquartered in Auckland, so we'd see their boats in the harbor all the time. But while we were there, they were gearing up for a new America's Cup, a new race. And they had a series of commercials trying to get the whole country on board. And they all had this tagline, we do what we do to make the boat go faster. 
we do what we do to make the boat go faster. So the commercial would come and you'd see this amazing boat skimming the waves and going through. And then you'd see the sailors doing all their thing. And then the commercial would move and you'd watch the sailors get off the boat. And some guy with a laptop would come and start taking data from what just happened on the water. And somebody else would come and start pulling the sails down to clean them. And someone else would show up and they'd swab the deck. And then each of them in turn would look at the camera and they'd say, we do what we do to make the boat go faster. What's your part, New Zealand? And the continue, it would continue. So people around the country would, would joke, you know, as they bought Emirates Team New Zealand t-shirts, we do what we do to make the boat go faster. But it's that same kind of partnership we're seeing. Paul, Silas, Timothy, the Bereans, these young believers, they're doing what they're doing to make the gospel go farther. We do what we do to make the boat go faster. And it's that same kind of partnership we long for and we practice here at Twin Oaks. The first thing I want to say by way of application is that Twin Oaks has this heart. It may be harder to see now in these past few weeks, but the ministries of this church don't run because Russ quarterbacks the ship. They run at the hands of volunteers, staff, leaders, elders, deacons, many, some who are just at home praying, some who are giving. We do what we do to shine the spotlight on Christ. And that's the heart of our church. How about you? Maybe you're thinking, Andy, this is a lot of pressure. This is too much. You've called me to faith. You've called me to endure in the face of opposition. You've called me to all of these things. I, I know, <laughs> you know, uh, honestly, when I walked into church this morning, I was going to now tell you a story about Polycarp, an early church father who was burned at the stake for refusing to renounce Christ. And I was going to hold that up. And I was actually being crushed by the story myself. Because, you know, <clears throat> you know, what's special about Polycarp, you know what's special about Paul and Silas and Timothy and these young Bereans and these Greek women of high standing and many, you know what's special about them is nothing. What's special about them is Christ. What's special about them is that they have a faith in an amazing Savior that caused them to persevere to the end. It's the same heart of Jeremiah from Lamentations 3. My Endurance has perished, and so has my hope. And maybe that's where you are today. Maybe that's what this time has accomplished in your heart. Remember, Jeremiah then says, This I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies are new every morning. So even if you feel that you've exhausted them last night or yesterday or last week, day in and day out, they are new. And they are new for you. Every morning, put your hope in him. It's that same faith that Paul commended to the Bereans when they examined the Scriptures and believed. It's that same faith that the Thessalonians rejected when they chose to incite the crowd. It's that same faith that Paul, Silas, Timothy, the Bereans, and many persevered in in the face of opposition. And it's that same faith that's on offer for you today. Christ is the same. His love endures. His mercies are new. God's word is true and trustworthy. Believe it. Persevere believing it. You must. And so must I. Let me pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for the charge from the scriptures about Christ. The one who stands up to examination, the one who you can't, there's no curtain you have to hide behind. He's not the great and powerful Oz and secretly a small old man pretending. No, he is God and he is our Savior. Father, help us to see the truth and the necessity that the Christ must have suffered and died 
and that that Christ is Jesus who suffered and died and rose again. And Father, give us hearts of faith, eyes to see, ears to hear, and hearts that turn, repent from our sin in the face of this confrontation and trust in you again and again. Thank you, Lord. Help us, we pray. Amen.